Hello and welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. <laughs> Hello, Martin. <laughs> Is this the type of thing that's happening to us? Well, it looks interesting. Well, let's let's see what it where it takes us. Yeah, maybe calm seas and just smooth tranquil sailing. waters. Smooth smooth, smooth. You feel like smooth sailing? I need. We need to pray. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, thank you for all the wonderful truths that you've put in the Word. Help us to delve deep into them and discover all the wonderful gems that you've put there and to place it into perspective that we can learn from it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've titled this one, Enacted Parables. Uh, we want to talk about a specific one, and just to create the backdrop, I think we can look at a few enacted parables in the Bible, just generally about the Bible, Martin. Mm. Have you ever read a book like this one? No, it's impossible to read something like this, eh? because you, you read a story now and you read it in three weeks again, and it's totally different. And it's a different story, okay? Now, if you take a penny horrible off your shelf and you read it, then you're done with it for the next 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you read it, it's going to be exactly the same as it was last time. Mm -hmm. You might forget what it said, but uh, eventually it'll be exactly the same. But this one is, is new every morning. Yeah. And the same verse that you read yesterday, as you say, is not going to say the same thing tomorrow because the context will be different. So you can read the Bible like a historic story, mm -hmm. just go through it, and then put it on your shelf and say, okay, done with that. You can read the Bible as a prophetic book. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people always ask, um, what percentage of the Bible is prophecy? The whole Bible. Every sentence is prophecy. Mm -hmm. How much is history? Also the whole one. How much is salvational? Yeah, the whole one. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So everything is 100% prophecy. So if you can't find prophecy in every sentence, then you need to read it again. Yeah. And you can decide how you want to read your Bible. You can read it, as I say, as a storybook. You can read it as a prophecy book and as a, as a puzzle. You know, people like games that are like quests and something like that. Well, there's no better quest game than that, mm -hmm. trying to figure out where, what fits and how it fits. And then you can read it by looking at enacted parables. Mm -hmm. Jesus taught in parables. Yes, so that they could understand. And he predicts that he's going to preach in parables. So was he only going to start when he came no. and not have parables before? No. No, he had many, many parables. The whole Bible, it's his nature to speak to you like that, to, to awaken something in your thinking patterns that might be slumbering. Yeah. Whereas if you told the person directly... Mm they would uh, get annoyed or reject it or whatever. But if they look at uh, a parable, they might ponder, what yeah. can this mean? Yeah, th maybe the description of, for, to, to maybe just explain what does it mean to say that it's an in, in acted parable? Well, it's like a, like a theater portrayal of an event. But there's a, there's a hidden meaning in the parable. So it's a real life situation, but it's showing towards something greater. Yes, all right. Sometimes the parable is an instruction from God to perform a certain act of theater mm. as an as a example. And sometimes which is far more interesting, is when it is written into the life of a person. Yeah, yeah. Because that person still has free will. He has free will, but he is enacting a story. Yeah. And the life 
So let's take Daniel. If you read the story of Daniel, that could just be a historic story. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, Daniel. And, and you know, kids, Daniel in the lion's den, is there a greater reality in that story? Or let's take David and Goliath. Yeah. Is it just David killing Goliath? Or is there a greater reality in it? And how does it all fit together? So let's give a few examples of these kinds of stories in the Bible, and then we want to discuss a specific one, right? Yes, we're working towards something. Yes. All right. So in Acted Parables, you have the story of Abraham and Isaac. Let's just start there. Now, there are many, many aspects about these particular individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Hosea, Daniel, Ezekiel, all of them, they not only are real-life people, mm -hmm. they don't only have real lives, but they also enact parables. Yes. So and sometimes these parables, as we have said, are written into their very lives and are not just instructions of a performance. Yes, so it's not a direct instruction, God telling them this is what the, how it should be, and then this is the lesson for the people. All right, if you take Abraham and his life, mm. his real life story, he had to come out of Ur, mm -hmm. and he had to separate from his family. He had to go to another country where he was a sojourner and never had anything. Yeah. He went down to Egypt. He came back from Egypt. All of those stories are actually examples of a greater reality. Mm. But they really happened in his life. His life yeah. And we have to follow the same path. Correct. We have to come out of our Ur of the Chaldeans. We have to separate from Babylon. Yes. We have to break with the traditions of our families. Mm -hmm. We have to become sojourners and strangers in the land of promise. In other words, this earth has mm -hmm. been promised to those that are redeemed. But you're just going to be a sojourner there. And you're not going to have an easy time. And every now and then we have a tendency to run to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, face our problems by trying to concoct stories and lies to get out of the situations that we are in. So written in his life are realities that are uh, for everybody that ever lives. Yes. Right? But he also had to enact parables. Yes. So that's his life story and then there was an... In, in fact, his entire <laughs> life story is an enacted parable. Yeah. But then he had to perform a specific one. Yes. And Isaac, of course, was paramount in that story. And then he gets the instruction, go and sacrifice Isaac. Mm. Now that must have totally stressed him out, right? Of course. And he goes to a particular mountain, which is actually the same mountain on which the temple would be built and that portion on which there would be a crucifixion. He had to take the wood and he had to lay it onto the back of Isaac. They had to go up the mount. And Isaac said, here's the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And then he had to sacrifice Isaac. And at the very last moment, God will supply the sacrifice. But and he already sacrificed Isaac mentally. Mentally. You're absolutely right. You had to go through that process. Yeah. Uh, have you, in your life, sacrificed Isaac? Yes, there has been portions. Oh, I've definitely had to sacrifice Isaac because the Son of God had to die for us. All right. And he had to die because of My your sins. transgressions. Mm -hmm. uh, did Adam have to sacrifice an animal. Yes. So everybody has to make that sacrifice. Every single person. 
uh, does something have to die in you? I mean, if Abraham had to think about it and he had to say, okay, I'm going to sacrifice Isaac. Did something die in him? Yeah. It's like his whole life was just over, right? Yeah. He was the son of promise and it was just over. He, he, the turmoil he must have gone through was tremendous. Yeah. And it's a type. It's a type. It also shows how much trust and faith he had in God. Yes. That even though he had to go through this loss inside, he knew that God would su su supply. So the King James says, God himself will supply the sacrifice. Uh, the new translation says for himself, which is of course a totally ridiculous, ridiculous translation because God doesn't need a sacrifice for himself. Yeah. He has never sinned. Yeah. He will supply it himself. So that was a type and an acted parable showing the greater reality of the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. And it was enacted absolutely perfectly. And they both came down again from the hill, so there would be a resurrection. Yeah. So his faith was so challenged, and he knew that there must be a resurrection yeah. at some stage. Because why would God say that this is the son of promise, and that all nations mm -hmm. will be blessed through him, and he's dead? Yeah, wouldn't make any sense. Wouldn't make any sense. So there's a beautiful enacted parable in... Uh, the case of Abraham and Isaac. Now, if we look at Hosea, that's an interesting enacted parable. Yes, that's not uh, such a comely example. Yes, it's a, it's a rather sad example. So poor Hosea has to marry Goma. And Goma is... Not exactly a lady of repute. No. <laughs> and she runs off occasionally. And then he has to go and purchase her. Yeah. And he, he, he gives his whole self to get her back. And it's such an interesting story. Poor Hosea the prophet. It's an enacted parable of the relationship between God and his people. Yeah. The woman is the church, right? And so it shows how we go astray and how God goes after us. It tells us something about the character of God, how he, how he gives of himself. Yeah. And he must have been in love with her. Yeah, it, sh it must have been because it's interesting if you say it like this because <laughs> he, she actually belonged to him. But he still had to purchase her back. Yes, because she was always going astray. It's the same with God. We belong to him, but he had to sacrifice himself just yeah. to get us back. Okay, so there's another uh, enacted parable. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the details in a moment. All right, let's look at a few others. Daniel and his friends. There is a an actual event that takes place in the life of these people. So this is not an instruction from God. You go and do this now, and this will be the consequences, and then you go and do that, this, and the other, as in this case of, of Abraham and Isaac. But Daniel's whole life is an enacted parable. Mm. It is a type of the life that God's people will be confronted with. Yeah. And the circumstances around it are exactly what God's people will be exposed to. Mm -hmm. So Martin, will you be thrown into a literal lion's den? Probably you can. Yes, maybe. Yeah. Did the early Christians get thrown into literal lion's dens? Yes. Was the outcome always as favorable as in the case of Daniel? No, unfortunately not. But they, like Daniel's friends in the oven, said, though he slay me, and they were martyrs. And yet will I trust him. But the greater reality is, even if the lions should have eaten him, 
there would have been salvation. Yes. But there had to become a greater story. Yeah. Now, what was the lifestyle that Daniel had? The whole life of Daniel. If you study Daniel, then you will come to the conclusion that Daniel, to me, is very depressing. <laughs> the reason why it's depressing is because he doesn't put a, put a foot wrong. <laughs> All the other characters in the Bible, let, be it Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or any one of them, they always are blundering along, yeah. making mistakes. But Daniel is immaculate. Yeah, he didn't make a, um, a fault. But then he admits that he is not immaculate because Sin. in his prayer he says, yes. we. we. We have sinned. We, we have, have sinned. So why is he portrayed as immaculate? Because that is what God actually wants his bride to be. All right, that's where we have to strive for. Daniel never, never said, I've arrived. No. No, never. But this is where we have to go. Yeah. And if you think about the sadness of it, before he arrives in Bas Babylon, he is emasculated which is a rather sad state of affairs. So the eunuch is the one who has to take care of them. And basically in this world we suffer spiritual emasculation. Our, our, our manhood is actually taken away and we are put into the slavery of sin. In a sense we are captives of another power. Mm. And here he is in Babylon. But he has a, a certain character. And one of the first things he does is he confronts what's on the table. Yeah. Hmm? And why? Because they have to get clear minds. Aha, uh -huh. all right. So Daniel has to have a clear mind. And he remembers what Solomon wrote. When you sit at the king's table, put a knife to your throat lest you partake of his delicacies. Mm. So here is an example. Are there any that join him in this example? Yes, only three. Three. It's rather sad, eh? Yeah. Out of all the captives probably, that were taken. Yeah, probably 800 or so. Yes. There were three. That's not a very good statistic. And when it came to the confrontations that they had, where their faith was tested, we don't hear anything about the others. No. We only hear about Daniel and his friends. And for the rest of the st story, you only hear of them. All right. Were the others ever thrown to the lions? No. Were they thrown into fiery furnaces? No. Were they... Uh, disobedient when it came to bowing down. No. So they actually had a good life. So they, they didn't have these confrontations. No. Probably people said, so you're right, you fanatic. <laughs> Off you go <laughs> to the lion's den, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, okay. Look at these fanatics. They're, they're being thrown into a fiery furnace. Serves them right. I guess there must be some that speak like that yeah. because it happens in real life. So here is a, a typological life which has a typological lifestyle. And we'll come to some of the other little details later. So all of the stories that we read about Daniel and his friends are enacted real life parables and stories applicable to us, mm. right? Yeah. Okay, so that's another example in the Bible. Then we have the story of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet during the exile, and he was a contemporary of Jeremiah. And the interesting thing is, God tells him to enact a couple of parables. <laughs> 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 and uh, if you read his story, there are realities associated with it. And, uh, perhaps we can look at one or two of them. Ezekiel chapter 4. 
Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. And lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it and set battering rams against it around about. And moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city. So poor Ezekiel, like a little boy, has to go and build a Meccano set there. Mm -hmm. And he has to do all of these things. And then he gets an instruction which would totally freak me out. Lie there also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it that thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. 390 days so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So every day he had to go for a whole year and more go and build his little <laughs> city image and the pan and he had to lie on his side and stare. Yeah. They must have thought, is this guy nuts? Mm -hmm. huh? And then he gets the instruction. So do it again and go now lie on your other side. Now, they must have looked at this and they thought, what's going on with this, prop with this prophet? And then he has this instruction to go and bake an Ezekiel bread. Mm. It's a very healthy bread, by the way. If you take all of these components, wheat, barley in verse 9, beans, lentils, millet, fitches, and bake a bread, the fitches is spelt. Mm -hmm. Have you eaten spelt bread? Yes. That's all I bake these days. It's amazing grain. Eh? Mm -hmm. It makes a very light bread. Yeah. and uh, Also very digestible. Very digestible, yes. I love spelt bread. And uh, we get our the whole kernels, we make our own yeah. flour, and we bake a spelt bread with different combinations. Yeah, yeah. You can put a little bit of all of these other th interesting things in it. But that's another story. And then he gets an exact instruction as to how much he may eat. <laughs> and then he gets an even worse instruction, mm. which tells him how to bake it. Yeah. That he has to take <laughs> human excrement to bake it. And this is where he loses. And then I said in verse 14, Now, Lord God, behold, my soul has not been polluted. I can't do this. No, this is not too much. I mean, I've been lying on my side here. I've been building little mounds and sitting with pans, and now I've got to bake bread with human droppings. And God says to him, okay, you can take cow dung. <laughs> 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 it's not much better, but it's probably a little bit better. And then he gets this instruction of how much he can eat. And it's, it's a starvation diet. Yeah. Uh, it's a starvation diet. Now, what's the meaning of all of this? Mm. It's, a, it's to create a hunger for the Word through starving them. Starving them, not literally, but starving them for the Word. Yeah. Isn't that something that will happen in the last days? In the last days, and it did happen through the ages, and it will definitely happen in the last days as well. Well, we can see that. We already... And people, will, and people will be running to and fro looking for the word and they will not find it. Yeah. It's, it's an enacted parable. It's actually a very beautiful story. Well, another one comes to mind, Jeremiah, mm -hmm. who has to take a loincloth. Mm. Uh, in modern terminology, your underpants. <laughs> and he has to go to the Euphrates. That's where Babylon is, right? That's it. And he has to go and hide it in the cleft of a rock, bury it. And then after many days, months, he gets the instruction, go and fetch your underpants. Go and get your loincloth. And off he goes and gets his loincloth. And it's totally destroyed. And he says, you know, this loincloth is useless. <laughs> it's totally 
perished and rotten. I can't, I can't wear this thing. And basically, the Lord tells him that this loincloth is Israel. Israel that went into Babylon and was polluted, polluted and rotten. And, and rotten. And he says, but this is, this is how I feel. Now, you know, when you, when you put on a loincloth or an underpants, that's about as intimate that you can become yeah. with yeah. A, a piece of clothing, right? So what was God trying to say? He said, this is my relationship with you. It's a very intimate and a very personal relationship. Mm. And look what you did. You went to Babylon and you got yourself all polluted and now you expect me to wear you again. It's like the story of, of uh, Hosea and uh, Goma. Yes. Polluted and it's, take her back. So here's a portrayal in Hosea of, of what it looks like in terms of the marriage relationship. Here's a story enacted by Jeremiah which shows that uh, how intimate that relationship is. And how terrible it must be for the one who has to wear that filthy garment. Mm. What kind of picture of God do you get from these enacted parables? I think a lot of caring. Huh? Because even though it seems harsh, it enacts how he feels about us. Yes. And it's a very personal God mm. and it's a very intimate God. It's not just some God up there that is never intimately associated with his creatures. And the other example that we have on the screen here is John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, is there an enacted parable in the life of John the Baptist? Note for definitely. He's the forerunner to make clear the way for the Son of God. All right, and he's called the Elijah, or the second Elijah. Yeah. But there's reference to another Elijah that would come just before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Exactly. So if you study the life of John the Baptist, you have to study the attributes of the final Elijah and what he is supposed to be like. Now, again, when you look at his story, is there, like in the case of Daniel, a specific lifestyle? Definitely. Once again, his lifestyle was showing the same as Daniel, to have clear minds, to be able to accept the truth. All right, and his diet was locust and wild honey. Mm. Of course, that was St. John's bread, which is the carob bean, and not living locusts. And honey is a plant product. Mm. It's not eaten by the bees. It goes into a different chamber and is converted into honey. It's not pre-digested food. Mm. So it is plant-based. So John the Baptist had a plant-based diet. Did Daniel have a plant-based diet? Yes. Yes, give me pulse, which is plants, vegetables, and beans, and everything that goes with it. So there's a specific lifestyle. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and John the Baptist came not eating and drinking. He was very particular. Mm. Was Ezekiel particular? Yeah, of course he was. He said, I'm not going to... I'm not going to do this. Uh, please, uh, please, this is just too much. <laughs> can, can we modify it? All right. It was an issue of addressing the defilement of the people. Mm. So here John the Baptist was different. You know, in the world, when you look at movies that have John the Baptist in it, he looks like a wild, yeah. moronic idiot. Yeah, with this hair like this, and they take that coat of woven um, camel skin and make it as if he's a as, we as if he's wearing the skin, yeah. which is not the case. It was a finely woven garment made from camel's hair. So John the Baptist is peculiar. Mm. He doesn't eat like the rest of them. He doesn't dress like the rest of them. And he has a very particular message. Make straight the way of the Lord. 
He addresses certain issues, even with kings. Don't break God's commandments. Mm. In his case, he was referring to the seventh commandment, which is referred to in Hosea. Yeah, it's a, no, adultery. Breaking the seventh commandment is breaking a personal relationship. So if you break the commandments of God, then you are not in a covenant relationship with God. Yeah. So he calls people back to a covenant relationship with God. It's like a marriage. It's like a marriage. So the story of John the Baptist, his message, and everything that pertains to it is a type of the message that has to go to the world at the end of time. So those are examples of enacted parables in the Bible. Now, you can read your Bible also by looking at the names and studying the names. That's a totally new way of reading the Bible. Mm. Let's look at some of these stories that we looked at and see if we can glean anything out of the names. And uh, the plan of salvation is written in names. But that's important to know. The plan of salvation is written in names, not the names is salvational. No, no, of course not. The plan of salvation, you have to look at the story behind the story. So if you take Abraham, we discussed him, for example. His name was Abraham. Mm. And that means high father. Yeah. And then his name was changed to Abraham, father of a multitude. Mm. All right, so Abraham represents those that are saved through the righteousness of Christ. And he lived his own life. And then he had to come out of Ur. And then he had to leave his father's house. And then he had to become a sojourner. And he had to become the father of a multitude. Now, when you were living your own life, partying, going to the rave culture, being a, a DJ, making a lot of senseless noise, <laughs> moving and swaying, you, you're probably also the father of a multitude, but not a very good multitude, right? No. Then it's a, you have to get out, out of her. So anybody that lives the life that Abraham lived, in other words, who separates himself from that which is evil and separates yourself to the Lord. Now there's an interesting verse in the Bible where it says, even the, the, the stranger that separates himself to the Lord, mm. that keeps the Sabbath. Mm. Yeah. So the Sabbath is a sign that you have separated yourself to the Lord. To the Lord, yeah. So all of these stories in the Bible are fascinating. So Abraham's name, Abraham, high father, his name is changed to Abraham, father of a multitude. So he becomes the precursor, as it were, to anybody who receives the plan of salvation. In Abraham's seed, you all become part of the spiritual Israel. Correct. So the same applies to Abraham's wife, Sarah. We read in Genesis 17, 15, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. There's a subtle change of name, which is a depiction of a, a character change. So Matthew Poole's commentary says, Sarai signifies my lady or my princess. Can you see there's an element of self in there? Uh, he's the high father and this is his wife. But now they have to become examples of the plan of salvation. And this confines her dominion to one family. But Sarah, Sarah, signifies either a lady or princess simply and absolutely without restriction. In other words, she's going to become the mother mm, of, this multitude. of this multitude. 
So you have gone from a, from a selfish life to a non-selfish life. And the Bible also says, more are the children of the barren woman. Mm. These women were all barren. Yeah. God supplied. And yeah. even if she'd never had a child, more would be the children of the barren woman than of the non-barren mm. woman. Because what kind, of, what kind of offspring are they producing? Mm. Those that will be heirs to salvation. So, rewritten in the names you have actually enactments. Yeah. You, have, you, can, you can read the plan of salvation. What's the other one that we spoke about? We spoke about Hosea. What does Hosea mean? It means deliverer. Mm. Now, isn't he depicting God? Yeah. Isn't he depicting Jesus? Yes. Isn't he running after his estranged wife? Yeah. And goma means completion. So in the end, this estranged wife will be brought to that's, completion. That's it. It will be brought back. So the beginning of the word of the Lord, Hosea 1 verse 2, by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms, for the land has committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Goma, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. Now we discussed that as an enacted parable. Yeah. Let's look at the names. Mm -hmm. So the names of his children were Jezreel, Lorahuma. And Loami, those were the names of his children, two boys and a girl. So let's have a look what Mayer's commentary says about these names. God gathers the outcast. The story of Hosea is a pathetic one. <laughs> he felt impressed that it was his duty to take his wife, one whose earlier life had been unchaste. From this marriage resulted three children, the names of whom are terribly significant. They are as follows. So the first one means God will scatter. The second one means not an object of favor. And the other one's name means once my people, but not so now. Would you name your children that? <laughs> I wouldn't um, choose it, but... If the Lord wants it to have an enacted parable, it probably would have been. <laughs> so somehow God must have impressed him that these are the names of his children yeah. that come out of this relationship of whoredom. Yeah. Here's the history of many a soul. In spite of all God's tender love, we may wander from him in the path of sin. The chapter closes with brighter prognostinations. In part, these latter verses were fulfilled by the return from Babylon, and they will be fulfilled in literal fullness someday, probably sooner than we have been wont to suppose. It is good to lay the emphasis on in the place, there. How often we are taken back to the very circumstances in which we appear to have failed most conspicuously in order that they may receive the crowning blessing of our life. Hosea 1 verse 10, Leave God to vindicate you. He will bring you from the land of the enemy and extort this confession from the mouth of your critics and foes. It's not a bad commentary. No. Yeah. Sort of sums it up, right? That's it. And um, once again, we can see that all the enactments were a story that God wants to show us how it pertains to his bride. Okay. So have we established that the Bible is full of enacted parables? Yeah. No, for sure. Right? We've established that. Have we established that uh, you can read these parables even in the names of the people? Yeah. And sometimes the names are really strange. And... 
sometimes God didn't even directly say, this is what you should name your children. Yes. But in them naming their children, it's still an enacted parable. Correct. Let's just make sure, let's get one or two more examples just for completeness. The story of Ruth and Naomi. Mm. In Ruth chapter 1, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. The famine is always a dearth, a, a lack of spirituality. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. You know, whenever there's a dearth, we always want to go to some other religious experience. So off he went to Moab. Should he have gone there? No, not at all. Probably not, right? And the name of the man was Elimelech, which actually means, my God is king. Hmm. And the name of his wife, Naomi, which means pleasant. So there is a lot of good in those names. And the name of his two sons, Malon, <laughs> means sickly. And Kilion, wasting, wasting away. Now, as a result of going to Moab, you have a terrible situation. <clears throat> Your offspring is sickly and wasting away. Yeah. It's an interesting enacted parable in the names. Mm. And uh, so they were actually Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. So they were God's people. But they were sickly and wasting away, the offspring. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. Did God permit that in his word? No, God did not permit this at all. All right, so this is what they did. They took wives of the women of Moab. There are consequences when you do that. Mm -hmm. They might be converted. But, but they might not, right? No, and there's always consequences. Even though they get converted, there's always consequences. All right. So the name of the one was Orpa, which means neck or fawn. So they have an interesting typology, okay? And her name means neck or fawn, the nape of your neck. You know, when you say, I will take you by the scruff of your hair, mm. you take you by the back. And the, this neck was tending back towards Moab. And the name of the other one was Ruth, which means friend. Mm. That's interesting, eh? So this one was a, a friend. A friend of what? A friend of the truth, perhaps? Yeah. Friend of God. Your God shall be my, my God. Mm. And your people shall be my people. And the only way to achieve this is to get out of Moab to go back to mm -hmm. where you belong, right? Yeah. And they dwelled there about 10 years. And Marlon and Kilian died. Also, both of them. That's pretty explicit. Mm -hmm. If you stay there, you're going to die. Yeah. Because you have become sickly and you're wasting away. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Just a little story there about how this works. Daniel and his friends, we spoke about that. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, which means judge of God, or God is my judge. Mm -hmm. Now he's a type of the end time people, what they must be like, and they will be a people of judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't there a message in Revelation which says the time of the yeah, judgment, judgment has come. Has come. And then you have Hananiah. God has favored or been gracious. And then you have Mishael, who is what God is. There will be a Michael that stands up, who is what God is. And Azariah, God has helped. So these are all very uh, faithful names. And they have a story. 
They have a story to tell for the end time people who will be living in the time of the judgment and God will favor these people and he will be gracious to them and they must develop characters of the one who is like Michael, who is like God is. And God will help them. Yeah, Isn't that nice? It's beautiful. It's a whole plan. The whole plan of salvation written in the names of the people. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar. Baal predicts the king, or Baal will mm. protect. Are they trying to change their religion? Yes. And to Hananiah of Shadrach, command all belonging to Aku. And to Mishael, it says, servant of Aku, or servant of the moon god. And to Azariah, Abednego, servant of Nigo, or servant of light. Mm -hmm. Now, who's the light bearer? Lucifer. Lucifer. So, is there a tendency in Babylon to change your religion from God is the one who judges, God is the one that favors and treats you graciously, and becoming like God in character to accepting Baal as your king to protect you, becoming involved in moon worship, and the moon worship often has a female characteristic. Yeah. So the moon can be as a male mm -hmm. deity or as a female deity. And then you become a servant of the light bearer. Mm. That happens when you get stuck there. That happens when you're stuck in Babylon, right? Is there a plan of salvation written in that? Yeah, for sure. Do you have to resist it? We have to go back to the original names. All right. How do you resist it? Only by the help of God, of Jesus. Okay. Does that mean you have to be very particular in how you conduct yourself? For sure. How you obey God, even in terms of lifestyle? Yeah. That's why we've got enacted parables, examples. All right. Martin, that was our introduction. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> If this is the way God writes his plan of salvation in the Old Testament, do you think he might ignore this kind of thing in the New Testament? No, for sure. Not. No. He will not. Did Jesus teach many things in parables? I think he only taught in parables. All right. So his whole, his whole way of thinking is parables. If he wrote enacted parables into the lives of people. Could he write enacted parables into the lives of New Testament people? Yes. That's his style. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's look at a particular one, which is very interesting. And uh, if people want more details, I did do a series once called From Crete to Malta. Mm -hmm. But let's look at it in terms of an enacted parable and let's go through it carefully. Bracing the winds. That's actually our subtitle there. Bracing the winds. Enacted parables. We want to talk about the story in the closing chapters of Acts. Acts 27 and 28. Mm -hmm. And see if there's an enacted parable. Yeah, if in it can story. be applicable to us. All right. Now, if this was if this was the story of the early church, which had the former reign, mm. would there be a parallel with the, the latter reign? Oh, but definitely. So, everything has an application. It's like type and anti-type. All right. We have the enacted type, but it's in a bigger um, way applicable to the antitype. They had to be born again, right? And uh, the last people also have to be born again. In fact, anybody who ever accepts the plan of salvation has to be born again. But the last message of warning will be of a universal nature, with a universal scope, with a mighty conflict. And so let's look at Paul's last journey. 
Couldn't this be the last journey of God's people? Yes. Why don't you read it and then we discuss it? Let's go through it verse by verse. 100%. And we start at Acts 27 verse 1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. All right, carry on. And entering into a ship of Adramitium, we launched, meaning to sail to the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. All right, so here we have the story. Paul is being sent to Rome. And he gives us a little bit of background. There were prisoners on board. Yeah. So, prisoners. People uh, that are captive in, to, in something. Yes. So, there were prisoners on board, and there was a centurion of Augustus's band. So, he was not a normal centurion. He was closely associated with the ruler himself. Yeah, with kingly. With, with the kingly band. And we have the names of certain people that were with him. And probably Luke was on this ship as well. Mm. And here they sailed. And from the outset, when they launched, yeah. the winds were contrary. The winds were contrary against them. So when this ship starts sailing... Mm -hmm. The winds are contrary. This is the final voyage. The final ship on its way to the final destination. Okay. And that final destination is a confrontation with Rome. Yeah. That's very important to realize. And the winds are contrary. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. Not well, let's have a look at our, our backdrop over here. Bracing the winds. So you're bracing yourself against the wind. Yes, and winds are an, ex an example of strife and war and hardship. Okay. Now, the winds were contrary. is not quite so bad yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll probably get worse, it's right? It's a little bit irritating, actually. Yes. So you're struggling along. That's mm -hmm. basically what it is. You're struggling along. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. Okay, so there's progress. He's moving along. Getting there. He's explaining the journey. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. Okay, so now there's a change, and you're now on a ship from Alexandria, and off you go. Now, uh, Alexandria is a very interesting city, the largest library in the ancient world was there and it burnt down. The whole thing burnt down to the ground. Wasn't Gnosticism very entrenched in there? There was so much occultism in those writings and so much Gnosticism in those writings that uh, it boggles the mind. But uh, that's another story. Whether we should go that deeply, I don't know. But And when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce were come over against Nidus. The wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone. All right, so they sailed slowly. The progress is not very rapid, right? It doesn't look as if you're going to be super successful in this journey. Yeah, and also doesn't... They, it's, uh, we're just carrying on. And the wind... The wind doesn't allow you to do anything that you really want to do. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lacia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship, 
more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Okay, so Paul is speaking. And Paul, of course, represents the Word of God. Yeah. And he says, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. Okay. Will the, the voyage of God's people and His church in the last days be with hurt and much damage? Definitely. Not only of the lading, that which is on the ship, and the ship, but also of our lives. Now, they didn't believe him. No, they'd rather believe the other people. Correct. Is there a parallel there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll believe anything of somebody else, but um, what the church and what the leaders and what our God showed us, oh, and what the spirit of prophecy is telling us, no, we'll rather go with something else. We'll rather go the other route. Okay, let's continue. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. All right, let's just stop there. I like the wording here. Mm. And people, you know, struggle with sometimes with the King James wording. But it's, it's so rich. Yeah. And if you don't know a word, look it up. That's it. You just study it. Come and up, step up to the plate. If you, if you struggle reading it, just read more. Read more. So it was not commodious. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I like that word. A commode is a sofa yeah. where you lie on and relax. It was not commodious. And so the greater part or the more, most of the people said, I don't want to be here. No. It's not comfortable. We want to go to that place where it's... Let's go to this other place. And it's much more comfortable there. And let's go there. Do we have a tendency to do that? Oh, and I wanted to ask, is it very commodious to work in a ministry these days? Uh, it's not very commodious. And if you think you want to go to a better place, you're going to end up worse. worse. <laughs> okay, so off they go. And what happens? And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. I love that verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. You think you're going to go to a comfortable place. I've now, I've accepted the Lord. This is going to be great. Smooth. This place is not commodious. <laughs> <laughs> you just want smooth sailing. We're off. We're going to another place. And then there is this tempestuous wind, <laughs> which is not a slight wind. It no. is a roaring gale. <laughs> and you end up in this mess and you say, <laughs> what happened? Yeah. But you weren't listening to what Paul said. <laughs> you were trying to find an easier path uh, and you ended up in a worse situation. Uh, okay. Such, tr such truth. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up in the wind, we let her drive. Okay, so now you can't even steer the boat anymore. You're in such trouble, you, you just... <laughs> Being taken wherever. Off you go. And running under a certain island which is called Clouda, we had much work to come by the boat. Much work. Now it's hard work. Now you're beginning to labor and the sweat is pouring down and you don't even have time to eat. No. You're stressing yourself into a yeah, coma. Yeah. Okay. Which, when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. Okay, so now the ship is in danger. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to help. They're going to undergird the ship. They're going to make sure it doesn't fall apart. Yeah, so that's putting a belt or something around it. and, and Strapping it. down things and making sure this thing stays together. Okay. Do you think God's people will be going through that situation? I think we're already there. We're starting to see we have to hold on to the truths and start getting it close and uh, hold. Okay. And fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. 
So are there more dangers around than just tempestuous winds and stormy seas? Yeah, there's quicksands. <laughs> what, what happens to you in quicksand? Uh, you just... <laughs> down you go and God. there's nothing you can do. So let's get out of here. And that can also be quicksands of thought, that so, you just get caught up in the depression. Let's get out of here. Let's strike the sails. Let's get out of here. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. Okay. So Martin, is it uh, possible that you're carrying a lot of baggage that you might not need? Mm -hmm. How about throwing it overboard? Getting rid of everything that is a danger to the ship. So you're in trouble now, and you are exceedingly tossed with a tempest. You're probably seasick by now. So let's lighten the ship. And then? And the third day, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Is this not insanity? Yeah. You're getting rid of that. That is supposed to, say, to help you and get this thing just fixed and ready for this. Uh, so are you now uh, reliant on faith alone? That's it. Because you've gotten rid of everything that you thought yeah. was necessary. So we're sitting in the final church. Yes. Heading in the storm. To a final destination. To a final destination. And now we're getting rid of everything that we cling on to, that we rely on ourselves. And we only rely on God. Okay. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Okay, now we're in big trouble. There's no sun and no star. It's dark. Is this world in a dark place? Yes. Is oh. it getting darker and darker? Mm. No sun. And I like the euphemisms of the oh. Bible. No small tempest. So it's <laughs> it was <a> roaring. <laughs> it was chaos. And all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Don't people today despair? Oh. What's the suicide rate like? I, I think it's escalated. It's, it's actually scary. It's scary, right? There's no hope. Depression, um, anxiety. No hope. And then these people go to COP28, mm. spin a lot of lies, <sighs> and tell you that's where the problem lies. The, the problem doesn't lie there. The problem lies elsewhere. Exactly. They go and spit fear. And the small, no small tempest is actually huge, and they just try and put the blame all on you again. And are they listening to Paul? No. <laughs> no. No. Not at all. They're on their way to something commodious, <laughs> but they're actually in a storm. Where they will own nothing and be happy. <laughs> okay, carry on. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. Right, let's just stop mm. there. Is another opportunity. Paul has an opportunity to preach. And he says, you should have listened, but yeah. you don't want to listen. You think it's going to be commodious. It's not going to be commodious. And the problem is not where you think it lies. The problem is much deeper. And you haven't taken any food. No. What kind of food could we be speaking about spiritually? The Bible. You're not listening to that. You're looking at climate change. That's it. You didn't take the spirit of prophecy. This storm, mm. Martin, was as a consequence of climate change. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 years ago. Never has there been such a storm before. Climate change. That's it. No. Spiritual declension. That was the problem. And that is also the problem today. All right. What was the problem in Sodom and Gomorrah? The same. They had... Much leisure time. Yes, commodious time. They were commodious. Yeah. Okay. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Okay, so there's going to be an accident. For they stood by me this night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all 
them that sail with thee. Whoa, this is amazing. Mm. Enter the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Huh? Exactly. In the midst of the storm, enter the spirit of prophecy. And those that listen to it, what will happen? They will be safe along with the rest that go with Paul. Everybody that goes with Paul will be saved. Everybody that accepts the message yeah. will be saved. What an amazing prom promise. Read here. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Oh, he believes God. Yeah. Not COP28. No. And he comes with a message from God that the angel showed him. So the storm is as a consequence or as a means to bring you to your senses. Mm -hmm. But you could say the storm is as a consequence of climate change. Mm. That wouldn't bring you to your senses. That would just lead to greater idiocy. It will just take, once again, that you are not to blame. You're just self, it's somebody else to blame again. Okay. How be it, we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. So we're going to have a collision with an island. Yeah. Now, the island is not mentioned here yet, mm. but it is about midnight yeah. that this will happen. Martin, when we reach the midnight of this world's history, there's going to be, be a collision. We have the eleventh hour past, I'm sure. So the gospel ship is going to have a collision. Okay, let's, let's continue. And sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. <sighs> Martin, uh, it's getting more and more dangerous. The storm is raging. The water is getting shallower. We're going to crash. Yeah. They put out four anchors. Yeah. They really don't want to crash. Right? And they're wishing for the day. Wishing for... We're starting to look towards this coming day. Oh, I'm also... Aren't you wishing for the day? <laughs> I cannot tell you how much I'm longing for that. I'm wishing for the day. Wow, what's going to happen? And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship. Whoa, what were they doing? <laughs> they wanted to get out. This can't be the right ship. No. Nope. I'm getting out. Okay, carry on. When they had led down the boat into the sea, under color as they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. All right, so here are people on this ship who decide this, is, this ship's not going to make it. Yeah. I'm getting out of here. I'm putting down my... A little lifeboat. Okay. They've got four anchors out at the back, mm. holding the ship, mm. pulling at its back, waves crashing from the back. Mm. So now they're pretending that they're putting anchors out in the front as well, mm. which is useless. Mm. And they want to actually get into boats and get away from the ship. Yes. What is the, what's Paul's response? Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship. He cannot be saved. That's probably a very important verse. This enacted parable has this verse in it. If you don't stay in the ship, listen to what Paul had to say. Listen to the spirit of prophecy that came over him. Uh -huh. You will be lost. Now, people get very angry when we say that these days. Mm. Let's rephrase it. Put super glue on your backside <laughs> and stay in the ship. Yeah. Okay. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not 
and hair fall from the head of any of you. Okay. Right. So here they are. They actually cut the ropes now. Yeah. They know it's useless what they're trying to do. They've given up the idea of getting off the boat. Yeah. So there's a very specific meaning in all of this. And he says, take some meat. Now, meat in the old King James means food. food. If it was flesh, mm. then he would have said flesh, mm. right? And he keeps referring to the 14th day. And then he says, you have eaten nothing. They are spiritually starved. That's it. Take in the word. Yes, don't be like the foolish virgins. Go and study. See where we are in the stream of time. Go and eat the word of God. And then what will happen? It will be for your health. Yes, sir. it's for your, be for your own benefit. Is this only spiritual health or could there even be physical health For sure for this? the physical health as well. So if you have, even the health message is here, and then what will happen if you do that? Not one hair will fall from the head of any of you. That's quite a promise, eh, Martin? Do you find this promise elsewhere in the Bible as well? Oh, many, many places. Many places. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. Is he setting an example? Oh, yes. And it's bringing us back to who's the bread giver. Okay. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. All right. So how important is the example? Absolutely. Very important. It's actually getting the one-mindedness. Has the storm abated? No, it's still raging. It's raging, right? But they, but they get, have they have good cheer. They get it. They calm. So in the midst of the storm, you can be calm. Yeah. If mm -hmm. if if you eat and partake of the word of God. Okay, let's continue. And we were all in the ship, two hundred three score and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. Right, and they took the bread, they ate it. Were filled. And now they're taking wheat. This was the cargo of the ship. Mm. Now what does wheat stand for? The bread of life. Uh, what are they doing with it? Casting it out into the sea. Uh, what does the sea stand for? Multitudes and nations and tongues. Okay, so now... They are ready to do what they were called to do. Mm. This is a typology. Irrespective of the fact that there were non-believers on this ship, it is an enacted parable of what is happening in the gospel ship. Yeah. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded. If it were possible to thrust in the ship, they're still looking for a way out. They're not going to find it. No, and it's still storm raging. All right, they're trying to find an easy path to land the ship softly. It's not going to happen, okay? And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward the shore. <laughs> now, that's amazing. They've now decided... That they're going to pick up the anchors, they're going to hoist the mainsail, and there's a roaring, tempestuous wind, and they're going to go for it. And now they're going to go for this head-on. Head-on collision. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. All right, two seas meet. It's an interesting statement in the Bible. Mm. Now, could it be that the multitudes, the people, the nations are going to meet in this particular place. In yeah. other words, two mindsets are going to meet in this particular place. In this place where this confrontation is going and to And there's going to be a clash. Yeah. And the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So the ship is actually beginning to break apart. But it's reached a certain very important destination. It is stuck fast now in it's this not confrontation. It's going to move past that part. It's like uh, 
Lucifer saying to Gabriel, whoa, you're not getting past me. Here's the final confrontation. Now, if uh, Gabriel mm -hmm. couldn't hold him up, who had to come and help him? Michael. Ah, Let's carry on. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. Will there be a death decree at the end? For sure. Right when this happens, a few moments later, there will be a death decree. So we can maybe make it clear. This stuck fast of the ship, this confrontation, is when the Sunday law is in it, implemented. Okay, but the, the death decree is not actually carried out here, Yet. yes? So it'll only be implemented later. A little bit later. That's why they said it's time to, give the, to, to kill, but not... They're talking about yes. it. Yes. But it's not being implemented. No. Okay. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose. So God is still containing this final thing. Yeah. And commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves into the sea and get to the land. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. All right, so they stayed on the ship, and now the ship is breaking apart. So there's a terrible shaking. Yeah. But they're still clinging to the boards of the ship. Yes. They haven't abandoned the pieces of the ship. No. They're still going. So this is the storm, and now there is this final crash where two seas meet, two mindsets meet, and two mindsets are going to clash. Mm. There's going to be a clash of minds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. I don't know why we took this name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to Acts 28 and read that. This is now the very last event that is portrayed in the book of Acts. So they're now on this island, and now we want to know, what is the name of this island? Yeah. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. All right, so now they know where they are. Mm. Now, that's the island of Malta. That's the seat of the military arm of the Roman Catholic Church, yes. the Knights of Malta. That's the army. And if you look at the emblems of the kings of the world, mm -hmm. they all wear the emblems of the Knights of Malta. Will there be a confrontation with the religious and the political world? Yes. The, and uh, those regalia is the Knights of Malta cross. Yes, the Maltese cross. So there will be a mindset confrontation mm. And the confrontation is between the gospel message and the military religious power that will rule at the end. Mm -hmm. And it is depicted as the island of Malta. And the people there are barbarous. Yeah. Barbarous. That's a terrible thing to say of the Knights of Malta. They're, they're dressed so nicely in all their regalia. Carry on. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. Ah, so here was rain. They were on land, and here was an abundance of rain. So they kindled a fire. Should we kindle a fire during an abundance of rain? We actually should start kindling the fire now when there's also just raindrops falling. All so right. didn't, Martin, didn't Jeremiah say when he said, I will no longer speak in this name? Ah, but your word was a fire in my heart and I could not. And here is an abundance of rain. Is this the latter rain being poured out when we have this confrontation with the forces of barbarism. I believe so. All right. And some of them are showing you no little kindness. Yeah. That's very interesting. So not everybody that is there trapped in this barbarous situation is averse to the idea, right? No. Well, that happened during the latter rain. 
Definitely. Okay, carry on. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffered not to live. All right. Now, the confrontation here, or this story, is the barbarians looking at what's happening to Paul. Mm. Now, the barbarians, who are the barbarians? The European nations, yeah. the, the ten horns, were called the barbarians. So here you have echoes of Daniel coming in. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons why they were called barbarians, according to some, is because of their language, which was different, and they couldn't understand it, and they said it sounded like ba 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 so they called it barbarians. That's just one of the stories. All right, so, Martin, so here you have the barbarians, which in modern times would be associated with the ten horns. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at this, and a snake attaches itself, and what happens? And he shook off the beast into the fire and found no harm. All right, but they also said, no doubt this, is a, this man is a murderer, so they're, they're very skeptical of him. Mm. But then they see that nothing happens to him. Now, there's a promise in the Bible yeah. that uh, you will tread on scorpions and serpents will bite you and you will drink poison and it will not harm you. Now, that has not been very prominently visible throughout the Christian era. But it's a promise for the latter rain. That's it. When this confrontation will be in its fierceness state. Okay. So it was also a promise for the, for the former rain. Mm. So now, in the latter rain, this will happen. This is the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Yeah. And when this happens, these people saying that, wow, nothing happened to him. Howbeit, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. All right, so now they're looking at him with different eyes. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laid us with such things as were necessary. Okay, Martin. So under this power of this latter reign, will there be signs and wonders that follow the believers? Yeah. Will there be healing? There will be healing. And I believe that this also shows to the people that will come out of that barbarous or that Babylonian state. Yes. And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteoli, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days, and so we went toward Rome. Okay, so there's this confrontation, and eventually in Rome there will be a captivity for a while, and there will be a final outcome. You know, Martin, we don't have to discuss the rest of it now, the final events in Paul's life and all of these things. The story of the final voyage mm. and the conflict that took place there is now basically complete. That's it. Up until the, the confrontation. confrontation at the island of Malta. 
So that is an enacted parable, or it is a possible enacted mm. parable. Let's not be dogmatic in lest we get into trouble. No, because the other ones is already you can see the uh, result. This is still unfolding. This is still unfolding. All right. You know, Martin, let's just wrap it up with a few statements from Spirit of Prophecy. Because people should have listened to Paul. Mm -hmm. Maybe they should pay a little bit of attention to these things as well. Yeah. This one comes from the Great Controversy. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. I think some will climb off the ship. Yeah. There will be a shaking. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. They want a commodious <laughs> life. <laughs> Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer to their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. You can find much of this in this last portion that we didn't read now of chapter 28. Just read what happened there. How there was confrontation and some believed and some believed not. Yeah. That's what happens that's what at happened. the end. And that's what happens when you leave the ship. That's what happens. So Martin, don't leave the ship. Yeah. I had an impressive dream last night. I thought that you were on a strong vessel sailing on very rough waters. Sometimes the waves beat over the top and you were drenched with water. You said, I shall get off this vessel, is going down. Remember the words of Paul. Unless you stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Yeah. Are we saved by the ship? No. No, you have to do some swimming and clinging to a board as well. Exactly. Sh you're not saved by the ship. The, s the saving was the faith. The faith saves you. No, said one who appeared to be the captain. This vessel sails into the harbor. She will never go down. But you answered, I shall be washed overboard, as I am neither captain nor mate. Who cares? I shall take my chances on that vessel you see yonder, said the captain. I shall not let you go there, for I know that vessel will strike the rocks before she reaches the harbor. You straightened yourself up and said with your positiveness, this vessel will become a wreck. I can see it just as plain as can be. The captain looked upon you with piercing eyes and said firmly, I shall not permit you to lose your life by taking that boat. Right? We cannot take this story and make it an absolute parallel of that which we just read. No. This is talking about the gospel ship that you have to stay on. That's it. And There was also a ship that you had to stay on. There was a final confrontation. But this one is the same. Don't leave the ship. This ship has got the truth. This ship has got everything that you need. Correct. Don't go to other ships and then try and throw stones at this ship. Correct. The timbers of her framework are worm-eaten. Don't go and join a Babylonian vessel. And she's a deceptive craft. If you had more knowledge, you could discern between the spurious and the genuine, the holy and that appointed to utter ruin. But if you had more knowledge mm. and discernment, mm. knowledge comes by reading and eating the Word of God. Yes. Discernment comes by obedient to all the principles, even those that Daniel was a type of. Yes, so that your mind can become clear, so that you can have discernment. Right. So the church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. 
It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless it must take place. Stay on the ship. The ship is on its way to a final confrontation. Yes, there will be a clash of minds. Mm -hmm. And you are either with the one side or with the other. And that is, I believe, the story in an enacted parable in the book of Acts. And if that be so or not, I believe there are tremendous lessons. And we should study so that we can be amongst those virgins that will enter into the wedding feast. Amen. Let's, Let's stand. Pray. Heavenly Father, what a tremendous story. What beautiful lessons are hidden in your word. Help us to appreciate it more and more. And help us, Lord, to cast out the wheat into the sea before it is too late. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.